You probably think you know your favorite foods like the back of your hand by now. After all, you've been eating them long enough to be an expert. But believe it or not, a lot of what you think you know about your favorite foods isn't the whole enchilada. So today, we're serving up some misconceptions about popular foods. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food Channel. After that, please leave a comment and let us know what other culinary misconceptions you would like us to correct. Okay, time to set the record straight. When you think of lasagna, odds are you think of Garfield, who's famous for absolutely loving the stuff, even though you shouldn't feed that to a cat. We actually have a lot of questions about what goes on in that house. But Garfield doesn't really love lasagna, it turns out. Yeah, not bad on short notice. He loves the American version of lasagna, which is different from the traditional Italian dish. What did I tell you? In America, most lasagnas are made by alternating layers of meat sauce, mozzarella cheese, ricotta cheese, and lasagna noodles. Some folks like to mix things up by using cottage cheese or even cream cheese instead of ricotta, which might leave you wondering, which way is the Italian way? Well, the answer is none of them. In a traditional Italian lasagna, you do a layer of noodles, meat sauce, mozzarella, and then bechamel sauce, which is a sauce made from milk, nutmeg, and roux, basically a mixture of butter and flour. So why did the recipe change when it came to the States? Well, diners weren't big on bechamel sauce, so Italian restaurant owners simply adapted to more American tastes by adding ricotta instead, proving once again that the quickest way to Americans' wallets is a bunch of extra cheese. There are also variations where the extra white sauce or white cheese layer is left out entirely, although those aren't as common. Sweet and savory, cheap and convenient, peanut butter sandwiches are easy to make and customize however you want, like the Mr. Potato Head of lunches. What are you looking at, you hockey puck? Seriously, peanut butter has done more collaborations than Pharrell Williams. It's a quintessential American food, but maybe not the American you're thinking of. As it turns out, the Incas may have been using a form of peanut butter hundreds of years ago. That makes peanut butter a South American invention, although North America can lay claim to the modern version. The peanut butter we all know and love, even if we can't agree on the whole smooth versus chunky thing, was first invented in 1895 by John Harvey Kellogg, the famous cereal maker. It's been an American staple ever since. Sorry, George Washington Carver. Right now you may be thinking, wait, didn't I learn that George Washington Carver invented peanut butter? Carver didn't invent it, but he did invent over 300 uses for peanut butter, including shampoo, shaving cream, glue, and so many others that it would take several videos for us to just list them all. Wait, shaving cream? My armpits will never be the same. Excuse me. I happened to be passing. I thought you might like some coffee. Oh, that's very nice of you. Thank you. When many of us grab a morning coffee, we'll reach for the dark roast if we're feeling particularly sluggish, like we stayed up too late playing Tony Hawk. This one is hard. After all, the dark roast is stronger, so it should wake you up more, right? Eh, not so much. The truth is almost the opposite. As a rule of thumb, if you're really trying to get the most oomph out of your cup of coffee, you want as light a roast as possible. That's because the beans haven't had as much mass burned out of them. Although in fairness, there really isn't that much of a difference. So what does that mean for those super strong coffees that claim to be the darkest, most intense roast and are covered with all sorts of health disclaimers? Well, to put it simply, they're full of beans. The truth is those companies are overcharging you for a blend that contains an unknown percentage of low quality coffee, like the punch bowl at a Folgers office party. Many cultures around the world regularly drink tea, but none have made as big a deal out of it as the British. For hundreds of years now, they've had a tradition of taking a break in the mid-afternoon for tea and biscuits, which are what the Brits call cookies, probably just to keep everyone on their toes. They literally just taste like nothing. I love them. I love them. This is like literally the essence of bland. For most outsiders, taking tea looks like one of the most fun parts of British culture. After all, who wouldn't enjoy stopping in the middle of the day to drink some Earl Grey and eat cookies? But why tea and cookies? Mmm. I'm digestive, can I say? Traditional British biscuit is made about 100 times better when dipped in a cup of tea. Some have concluded that the tradition came about as a way for people to flaunt their wealth during the days of the old British Empire. While that may or may not be true, there's actually a scientific reason for the biscuits. Long story short, black tea contains tannins, which you can also find in red wine. So if you've ever had a sip of wine and it really dries out your mouth, that's because of tannins. 
and can make you feel sick if you drink them on an empty stomach. So it's a good idea to always eat a little something with black tea. And that something might as well be cookies. The sweetness of the biscuits also helps mask the bitterness of the tannins in the tea. When most Americans think of tacos, they likely think of the hard shell variety you can find in grocery stores and restaurants across the country. It's one of Taco Bell's signature menu items, and the hard taco is so ubiquitous in the United States that in most places, you have to specifically request a soft taco, like you're ordering a Dr. Pepper with no ice. But at the end of the day, tacos are a Mexican dish, and nobody really eats hard shell tacos in Mexico. So where did this crunchy little guy come from? Well, it's hard to pin down exactly where it was invented, but the hard shell taco started becoming popular in the United States in the early 1900s, and has been popular ever since. However, if you're trying to find an American-style hard taco in Mexico, you will likely be disappointed. Not only are Mexicans extremely unlikely to put a taco in a hard shell even to please tourists, but also most tortillas are made out of corn, as opposed to the flour tortillas typically used in the U.S. Potatoes, or potatoes if you're a Gershwin fan, are pretty popular around the world, like the Tom Cruise of root vegetables. And they're especially popular in America, where people use them as a side dish for just about everything. From french fries with the skins removed to mashed potatoes with the skins removed, Americans really love their potatoes with the skins removed. Many American recipes specifically instruct you to peel the potatoes and discard the skins, like they're some sort of shameful secret. Aside from making the U.S. a terrifying place for the potato head family to live, the American practice of peeling spuds before cooking them is actually pretty unhealthy. Roughly 50% of the vitamins and fiber you get from eating a potato are in its skin. So when you peel a potato, you're essentially taking half of the good stuff and throwing it right in the trash. Although you may have some vitamin-enriched neighborhood raccoons that would thank you. Pasta carbonara, sometimes called chicken carbonara when it's trying to hide from its attorney, is an American dish you can find in Italian restaurants all over the United States. Recipes vary, but it's typically served with peas in it, along with a whole lot of everything else. Anyone ordering pasta carbonara in the States can expect to be served a goliath of pasta, meat, and veggies, including eggs, Parmesan cheese, cream, bacon, and chicken. Ironically, classic Italian pasta carbonara is a traditional pasta dish that was designed to be a simple way to make something quick and hearty out of whatever may be lurking in a fairly empty pantry. It's actually an easy recipe that usually consists of eggs, pasta, guanciale, black pepper, and pecorino romano cheese, not parmesan. Because guanciale is pork jowl, some chefs say bacon is an okay substitute if you can't find the real stuff, but chicken isn't ever supposed to be part of the recipe. It's also a big no-no to add cream, and mixing green peas into a pasta carbonara is considered a felony in Italy. As for where the name does come from, well, no one really knows. It's derived from the Italian word carbonaro, which means charcoal burner. That's led some to guess the dish was conceived as a meal for Italian coal workers. Other guesses include the possibility the name was derived from a Roman restaurant called La Carbonara, which may have invented or otherwise popularized the dish. Wonder where they stood on green peas. I am about to eat a la carbonara. I see my fortune now. You're gonna be eaten by a big greasy monster. Have a nice day. Fortune cookies are believed by many to be a quintessential element of Chinese cuisine. You finish eating, then you break open one of those crunchy treats to reveal some lucky numbers and your fortune. Then, assuming it wasn't exceptionally bad news, you eat your cookie. It's like a dessert invented by a gambling addict. But the truth is, fortune cookies are about as authentically Chinese as Tommy Lee Jones. According to most accounts, the fortune cookie was actually invented by a Japanese-American man from San Francisco in the early 1900s. Yep, fortune cookies are manufactured entirely in America. In fact, most of them are made by a group called Wonton Foods Incorporated in a factory in Brooklyn, which, as you geography aces may have already noticed, is not in China. Wonton is said to make at least 4.5 million fortune cookies a day, and the demand has become huge. Thanks to American culture, Chinese restaurants all over the world now end their meals with a fortune cookie. Except in China itself, where they don't serve fortune cookies at all. Who saw that one coming? Many of us probably think of pudding as a sweet treat, something to be enjoyed at the end of the meal or traded at the lunch table for an even more sugary dessert. 
But when it comes to British cuisine, it seems like anything can be a pudding, and often is. There are savory dishes like steak and kidney pudding, but there are also many dessert dishes called pudding. And to make things more confusing, dessert is referred to as pudding even if pudding isn't actually being served. How does every British meal not end in a fistfight? Believe it or not, calling everything a pudding actually has some important food history behind it. Back in the early days of England, people used to boil meat in an animal's stomach, presumably because there weren't any crate and barrels around, so they couldn't buy any pots. They called this boiled meat pudding, and over time, they started adding grains to go with the meat they boiled. This then evolved to boiling meat in cloth bags rather than animal stomachs and making recipes with more grains until they finally started making sweet puddings too. The humble snack pack took a long, meaty road to get to your lunchbox. So what do you think? Which of these misconceptions surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other Weird History Food videos.